As Mark said, we now have the joy and privilege of turning to the inerrant and authoritative word of God, and what a privilege it is to do exactly that. I encourage you to take out the word and follow along, whether just looking at the screen or using the bulletin, or of course, if you have a Bible. Today, we are in the New Testament book of Acts in chapter 16, verses 25 through 34. Hear now God's word. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. This is the word of the Lord. I have a good friend who, his name is Tommy Baker. I think some of you know him. He's lived in the community for a long time, and he was uh, riding his dirt bike in the spring of 2020 and had a terrible accident, a traumatic spinal cord injury, and he uh, was paralyzed from the waist down, has been for uh, since that time that he had the accident. He's praying and hoping that he is healed. He continues to pray for healing. We pray for healing for him, uh, but he has not uh, been healed at this point physically. This is a picture of him and his children. And um, Tommy is in my uh, discipleship group that meets every Wednesday. And we were just talking this Wednesday about some of the trials that Tommy has been through. And he said that... Um, He's, he's now uh, been blessed to receive this grant to go back to school. And he's going back to school to be a school teacher. And this is a, a, a guy who loves kids. He's been in, um, at, at his church, 514 Church, he's been serving in children's ministry for many years. He loves kids. He was in construction, that was his vocation, but after his injury, of course, he could not continue to do that. And he has had massive struggles over the last couple of years. And he still does have massive struggles. But what's interesting is on Wednesday when we were meeting and studying the Bible and holding each other accountable, he said that... He's actually very thankful that he went through what he went through because otherwise he would not be on the path that he's on right now to become a school teacher. And he, he intends to, and, and he has over the last couple of years, share the gospel with as many people as who will listen. And for other people who are going through difficult times, he wants to show compassion to them and, and lead them to understand who Jesus is. And and all of that is, is pretty inspiring. And, and it, it shows that like, here's a guy who went through something no one would have predicted, a, a terrible, terrible circumstance, and he's now using that and believes that God was in that, even as he hopes and prays for physical healing. And we're in this series called Practical Evangelism. That's what we're studying as a church, uh, practical evangelism in the Bible and in our lives and this morning, we're going to look at Paul and Silas and what they do when they are faced with a terrible trial and how their efforts to show compassion in a difficult situation, compassion during crisis, just exactly what that yields in the lives of people around them. So uh, pray with me, and then we will look at this text. 
Father, we thank you so much for your mercy and grace in our lives. We thank you for great examples around us, uh, fellow brothers and sisters in our church, not only in our church, in the wider community. Um, Lord, we, we, together, we lift up Tom Baker's family and, and all that he is, is working on. We pray your blessing over him, your continued blessing, and we do pray for his supernatural physical healing. Uh, we thank you for your word this morning, and we pray that we would understand it and that it would cause us to glorify you. And to, I, I pray for everyone who's here, those who are on the live stream, those who are here in person, especially those who don't quite um, know who you are yet, who haven't repented of sin, trusted in you. I also pray for those who are going through tremendous trials, and that you would speak to them especially, and that for all of us, we would submit to your word, as, as Pastor Ken mentioned, your inerrant word, and that we would trust it to guide us in our lives and to point us to the cross. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There are five points I want to make. I want to walk through the text, and uh, this first one is going to take a little bit longer than the, than the, the next four. Uh, but I want to begin with looking at Paul and Silas and what I will call their anti-fragile faith. And I'll get to that, that word in, in just a moment. But I want to tell you what happens leading up to the passage that Pastor Ken read. Paul and Silas are on a missionary journey. They're in a town called Philippi. And if you know your Bible, you may uh, know that, that uh, place because there's a book in the Bible called Philippians. So that's where they are, and they're preaching the gospel, and they're actually having some success. Because as they're preaching, it says that there's a, a, an entrepreneurial woman named Lydia who hears the gospel, and she responds to the good news, and she believes in Jesus. And so they're continuing their work of going and interacting with people and, and sharing Jesus with people. And they come across this young girl. And she's a slave girl. And this slave girl is demon oppressed or demon possessed. And all of this is very strange to our ears. Um, I don't think it's because that was superstitious then and we've grown out of it now. Uh, Satan is very strategic and he's very um, crafty, and he uses different strategies in different places and different eras. And I would say that our era in the West is one where we doubt the existence of supernatural things, period. And so what does Satan do? He numbs us and dulls us with entertainment and all kinds of things, and we, we scarcely believe in the supernatural. And that's what's happening in our era, and so we just don't see a lot, well, we don't know if we, if we see a lot of supernatural oppression like, like is found in Acts chapter 16 with this slave girl. Make no mistake, a spiritual battle is all around us. And, and there is a battle going on for our very souls. And um, God is sovereign over all things. And yet there is an enemy who will be defeated when Jesus returns fully and completely. He has already been defeated at the cross and through the resurrection, but he still prowls around like a lion. And uh, we need to be aware of that. In the first century, this slave girl is possessed by this demon. And the demon recognizes immediately what Paul and Silas are doing. And this is what, what the demon says through this slave girl. These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And then it says she kept saying this for many days. So over and over. Imagine Paul and Silas trying to approach, I don't know, normal people. And here's this slave girl shouting this behind them for days over and over again. That'd be pretty annoying, wouldn't it? Well, it's very annoying to Paul. And so he turns to her and he tells the demon to get out of her. And she's healed. And this poor slave girl is healed of this terrible oppression. Who knows what it would be, what it would be like to go through that. And, and all of a sudden, she's still a slave, but she's free. She's, she's no longer controlled by this wicked demon. And shouldn't we all celebrate that? Is that what the owners do? No. Why? Well, here's why. Um, and Karl Marx, I'm not a big fan, okay? I think he got a lot of, I think he got almost everything wrong. But there's one thing that he got right in, in many instances, and that is the phrase, follow the money, 
Okay, do you know what that means? Like if you really want to know why things are happening or what's going on, just follow the money. Understand where the money's going and then you'll understand motives. And that's true in, in a lot of areas of life. Well, the owners of this slave girl drag Paul and Silas to the town square. And their accusation against them is they do not, quote, advocate customs that are lawful for Romans. That's not their problem. Their problem is that the slave girl actually was a source of income for them because she could tell people's fortunes. And now that the demon is gone, they're really mad at Paul and Silas. And so they incite this, this riot, basically. And you know what they do to Paul and Silas? They strip them and beat them with rods and throw them into prison. So that is how Paul and Silas are in prison. Have you also, have you heard of this phrase? No good deed goes unpunished, okay? If you're Paul and Silas right now, what are you thinking? You're in prison, you're battered and bruised, you, you are alone, and you, you're, man, that would be brutal. They, they did a good work. They're doing the Lord's work. How is it that they end up in prison? It would be very, very tempting to retreat into bitterness and resentment and despair. Why, God? Why is this happening? How could you do this to me? Uh, is that what happens to Paul and Silas? Is that what they do? Let's look in verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Now, why were they singing hymns to God and praying? Well, perhaps it was because, you know how, like, sometimes we need to be reminded what we know is true. In fact, every Sunday we need to be reminded what we already know is true and what we've heard over and over again since we were children. Why? Because life is hard, and when we sing, we are reminded what is true. So that's probably part of it. If you had just been beaten with rods and stripped, then you probably would want to sing Amazing Grace too, okay? So if that ever happens to you, just remember, I told you what to do next, okay? <laughs> Why else are they doing it? Well, because they want to glorify God, even in this terrible situation. They want to glorify God. They do not just retreat into bitterness and despair and resentment. It actually seems that their faith is stronger as a result of what they've been through. My question is, is that true for you? And is that true for me? There's a guy named uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. He's, uh, he's a trader, and he made millions of dollars um, trading and investing, and he's now more of a philosopher and economist and critic. He's a critic of economists who, he says, do not understand real-world probability and risk. And he wrote a book called Anti-Fragile, Things That Gain from Disorder. The idea is that you want to make yourself anti-fragile in life, which means that when crazy things happen, unpredictable things happen, difficult things happen, you actually become not weaker, but stronger. This, this applies in all kinds of different domains. Like it, it applies if you have children in your home and you're raising them. If you raise your children in bubble wrap from age zero to 18, and you don't ever let them go out and do anything, and you don't ever let them take risks, and you don't ever let them make mistakes, then they will head out of the house and they will be in huge trouble. It, it helps them, actually, to go through difficult things and to learn and grow from them. The same is true with our bodies. If you do not stress your body physically sometimes in the form of, of exercising, of working out, what happens to our bodies? They become kind of soft. Why? Because... Our bodies were meant to experience stress. They actually grow stronger from the right amount of stress. And so this is a, a principle that's true in life, and it is also true in faith. And I think one of the things that we, that we sometimes get wrong um, when we go through trials and difficulties, not that we would ever want them, not that we would ever hope for them, but I think sometimes the reasons why we're not anti-fragile is because we don't understand the promises of God. I mean, 
God promises that you will be blessed if you live for him, if you live for Jesus, okay? And those blessings take all kinds of forms, like the blessing of having sound relationships, not perfect relationships, but if you know that the command to follow Jesus includes forgiving people around you and loving them like he has loved you, then you will just be less likely to be bitter and nasty. You know, if, if you follow Jesus, you will develop virtues, like patience, self-control, compassion. Why? Because that's, those are the things that Jesus commands you to, to, to have. Courage. Those are all incredible blessings. It is a blessing to live for Jesus. Amen? Amen. It's a great blessing. That is not the same thing as he'll make your life really safe and secure and happy. He doesn't promise that. He promises he will be with us through all kinds of difficulties. He doesn't promise that we will not have difficulties. And I think often uh, in, this, in, in the 21st century in America, we, we confuse that. And, and we, don't, we, don't, we don't realize that trials are just part of the Christian life. What does Jesus say? John 16, in this life you will have troubles. But take heart, I've overcome the world. We, we know we will have troubles May they make our faith anti-fragile. And, that, and that's actually what Jesus' brother James writes in, Ju- in James chapter 1. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This is an anti-fragile statement of faith. It's joy. Now, do we count it joy when we face trials? I don't. That's certainly not my instinct. But God is at work. He's doing something in you and through you. And you may not ever understand it fully, but he is in it for your eternal good. Amen? Say that with me. He's in it for my eternal good. One, two, three. He's in it for my eternal good. Therefore, we can be anti-fragile in our faith. We can actually have trials, difficulties, painful circumstances cause us to have greater, tougher faith. And that's what Paul and Silas exhibit here. They are singing hymns right after being beaten and they're in prison. And that leads to an incredibly compelling witness. Verse 26, suddenly there's a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. It's midnight, they're praying and singing. And all of a sudden, there's this huge event. Now, the singing and the praying, there's no causal link, at least, that's stated in the text. But they're singing, and and prisoners are listening to them sing. Do do you know that it's really encouraging to hear people singing? Amen. That That was one of the easiest amens I've ever received. Thank you, Pastor Mark. But really, were you encouraged by the choir singing, Jesus Saves? Yes. Do you know it's also encouraging when you hear people not mumbling or mouthing words, but singing words, singing hymns next to you? Do you know that? A couple weeks ago, um, in acoustic, there was a seven-year-old girl who was absolutely belting out the songs, and everybody around her heard her, and afterwards her mom just wanted to make sure that her heart was in the right place and she was like you know she she asked her why she was doing that because she wanted to make sure it wasn't just like being silly or drawing attention to herself and she just said mom I just love singing about Jesus and you know what that did to the I know oh yeah you know what that did to the people around her they started singing louder sing out loud don't it doesn't matter what you sound like Okay, just sing out and let other people hear you. Amen? Amen. Sing out loud, okay? That's what they're doing. Paul and Silas, people come around them. All of a sudden, there's this earthquake, and it is supernatural. It's not just coincidental, and and I think you can read that by reading not only that the earth is shaken and the door is open, but that their bonds all fall off, okay? I don't know that earthquakes do that every time in the prison. And so, all of a sudden, they're freed, and... What happens is they do not run out of the prison. It says when the jailer woke, 
Well, that says that he's maybe not doing his job in that moment. When he woke up and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. So from this we can glean that if, if, a, you know, if a prison ward allowed prisoners to escape, it was just, you got the death sentence. So he doesn't want that. He wants to, to preempt them by taking his own life And Paul says, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer is filled with despair, and he's ready to take his own life. And Paul, I mean, Paul and the others sacrificed their own freedom to save this jailer. And, you know, part of our witness, brothers and sisters, is to be willing to be compassionate and to care for people who need it. I mean, that's what the, the Minute for Mission was this morning. It's one very tangible, very practical way that we can, we can practice this. But to take time to help other people is a foundational work in the Christian life. And it builds credibility so that you and I might share the gospel with people. And sometimes the door that God provides is a literal one, like the one that the jailer walked through and that you know, Paul and Silas could talk to him about. Other times it's metaphorical where you are helping somebody, your neighbor, your coworker, and then the moment comes where they are open to hearing the gospel. You students, you know that there's a social hierarchy in your classrooms, in your, in, in your schools. If you are caring for the students that nobody else is really interested in hanging out with, that is a wonderful Christian witness. And that points them to Jesus, just, just by your compassion. Now, that's not the end of the story, and sometimes that's the beginning, because then that opens the door for you to be a compelling witness to do what Paul and Silas uh, do, and that is they practice very, very effective evangelism. And, and what happens here? Well, the jailer rushes in. He's amazed. He called for lights, rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, this is ironic because Paul and Silas are in chains, and yet the, the jailer, who is ostensibly free, is in chains, actually, spiritually. He's, he's, he's dead. And Paul and Silas though they are in chains, are ultimately eternally free. And they can sing hymns after they've been beaten with rods. Why? Because they know that God is just, and they know that God has a plan, and they know that God is at work even in the midst of this. And then the jailer comes in, and he has this incredible question, what must I do to be saved? Now, in my experience, I've not had someone ever rush up to me and fall on their knees and say, good sir, what must I do to be saved? I mean, I, I hope for that day. I pray for that, for those who I know and love who are not believers. Um, but at the same time, I have seen God so tangibly at work in an unbeliever's heart that it really did not take a whole lot of persuading and convincing it just took laying out the gospel you know and and even encouraging this this person to to just read what the what the bible says i mean that's kind of similar to this and and i don't think that you and i get a lot of opportunities like what paul and silas had when a guy just comes in and falls on his knees and and asks to be saved but every conversion is a supernatural event amen no matter who comes to Christ, you know, a child who grows up in this church who comes to believe in Jesus, that is utterly supernatural. That is a, that is a soul who is dead who is now alive. And so when people come to know Christ, it's a supernatural event every time. Um, we, we most times, it's, it's a longer process. And so we keep going. And we keep praying. And we keep talking. And we keep persuading and and we're bold and and we're patient and we're persistent and and we 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 want people to know Jesus and effective evangelists they they just keep persevering and praying and and they're bold to interact with people who don't know Christ there's a woman in our church who she has uh, all kinds of health issues herself she's she's an older woman and she has spent years 
caring for a man who is um, about the least attractive kind of man to serve based on his life and all that he's done in his past and all the sordid sins of his past and she is caring for him. Why? Well, she just loves Jesus a lot and she knows that she is called to serve and so she's willing to, to serve. Um, yesterday, my, um, my wife and my two daughters, we went and visited my Aunt Lee and she's now in her 90s and some of you know my Aunt Lee because she used to come to church regularly and she didn't move here until her, um, she was in her 80s. And it was really my, um, my parents who cared for her and figured out her estate and did all of these things to, to just show love and support and care. And, and, um, and she, my Aunt Lee, came to know Christ in her 80s. Why? Well, because there were a whole lot of people who just showed compassion. And there are people in your life right now who just need compassion. And absolutely, that is true within the, the confines of the church. Among our brothers and sisters, we're called, commanded to do that first. There are also unbelievers out there who just need our compassion, who need our love. And as we offer that love and compassion, there are opportunities to be effective evangelists. You and I, and um, notice that uh, after the effective evangelism, they come, the jailer comes to know Christ, there's this immediate discipleship that happens in verses 32 and 33. It says, they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his household. So it's not just the jailer, it's the household. And the jailer is willing to bring Paul and Silas to his home so that he can share the gospel and teach the word of God. That's not just evangelism, it's also discipleship. And it says, he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. I have a couple things to say about this. First, notice that it's the jailer's faith that leads to the baptism of the household, okay? It's ambiguous. We don't know if every one of the members of the household also believed in Jesus. Perhaps they did. But what's emphasized here is his faith and their baptisms. He's immediately obedient to the command of Jesus to be baptized. Are you a Christian? Have you been baptized? If you're not baptized and you are a believer in Jesus... You, out of obedience to him, you must be baptized. It's just it's very clear in the word of God that every follower of Jesus is to be baptized. Do you have children who are not yet baptized? I encourage you to have them baptized. Here, why? Because that is an expression of the covenant that God makes, not just with individuals, but with their families. And yes, there is a time when that child that grows up needs to repent of sins and trust in Christ. The water doesn't save, but the water of baptism is an expression of obedience to God that this covenant extends, just like it did to Abraham and his children, just like Peter says in Acts chapter two, the promise is for you and for your children. The promise is for us and our children by God's grace. We baptize them and we trust that Jesus will save them. Amen? So, Immediate, immediate discipleship. Another thing to point out here is that the jailer practices immediately what Paul and Silas have modeled. Do you notice how he feeds them and how he washes their wounds? I mean, washing their wounds, that sounds a little bit like Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. And this is a practice of discipleship. Immediately, he is enlisted to serve and to do the things that Christians do. If you are a newer Christian, or, you know, it's, it's, it's actually, it should be convicting to all of us, brothers and sisters, that some of us have been Christians for a long, long time and have really, really hesitated and struggled to share the gospel. Here the jailer is, about five minutes old as a new believer, sharing the gospel. Do not say, I just don't know enough, or I just need a little bit more, or I just, no, no, no. 
You have every, if you, are you a believer in Jesus? You have everything you need to share the gospel with other people. And it, it's so important to disciple them as well. And that's what Paul and Silas are doing. They are discipling immediately. And so it's really Paul and Silas's, their evangelism is very, it's very full orbed in the sense that it, it expresses, their evangelism is expressed in their character that they are singing and pray, praying to God in the midst of great trials. It's distinct and explicit Christian character. It's a readiness to share when the opportunity arises. They are sacrificially serving, and they are taking the opportunity not only to evangelize, but also to disciple. All of, the, all of these things are component parts of the comprehensive whole of their witness to a watching world, and amazing things happen. And this all leads to, verse 34, infectious joy. And he, the jailer, rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. He rejoices. There is joy in that household. The joy of conversion, forgiveness of sins, peace with God, being adopted into the family of God. And we have that joy, don't we? We have that joy whether our team wins or loses on Saturday. We have that joy whether or not things are going really well for our kids or they're really struggling. We have that joy whether our grandkids are respectful toward us or they don't give us the time of day. We have that joy whether we are going through deep, deep trials and difficulties and painful circumstances and we don't know why they're happening or, or whether things are going really well. Deep joy is the result of conversion of being in the family of God, and it goes deeper than our circumstances. And so what's amazing about this is that Paul and Silas are imprisoned uh, ostensibly because Satan wants to shut them up. It has the opposite effect, and the gospel goes forward to the jailer and out into the world. You know, the truth is that um, God keeps his own counsel. We don't know why things happen that are so difficult in our lives, and, and we may never know. But what we do know is that he is at work. He is using our circumstances to bring about his good and beautiful and right eternal ends. And so are we open to these things? Are we, are we willing to practice the same kind of evangelism that Paul and Silas practiced? Because we really want to see this joy spread, don't we? We want to see it spread. So may we go out into the world and do likewise. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. We thank you that you have called us uh, not only to know you, but as your word says, to even suffer for you. And for, for a lot of us, the, the blessings that you have given us are so incredible. And we, we just we look around at our lives and all we can say is, uh, we've been protected by hardship, and, and thank you for that, Lord. And, and then there are others of us who are in the midst of just incredible, painful tragedies and, and awful circumstances. And Lord, I want to pray for them in particular and that you would give them strength, that you would give them courage. I pray that, this, that your word would help them to trust you. Lord, I pray for anybody who is not yet a believer in Jesus, and I pray that uh, for anybody here on the live stream who doesn't know Jesus, that they would know that they can come to you simply by acknowledging that Jesus, you are the Lord who died for sins and rose from the grave, that, that, that we are sinners in desperate need of your help, and that we come to you by faith, believing that you died for our sins, believing that you literally rose from the dead, and that you are our Lord and Savior. I pray that anybody who, who would want to, to come to you would do that right here and now by simply repenting of sins and trusting in you. I pray that they would tell someone, somebody in our church, about that. And Lord, for the rest of us, make us, make us anti-fragile in our faith. Help us to go out into the world to share this great news, praying fervently for the people around us and boldly sharing the great news of the gospel. Hear us now, Jesus, as we pray according to how you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.